Welcome to Fundamentals of Faith from Love Walk Christian Center. with me right now. Stand, stretch forth your hands and come in agreement with me right now. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I command all that has been ailing my wife in this headache, and I command it to cease and desist its operations. I command it to go in Jesus' name, and I declare wholeness to her body, revelation knowledge, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of understanding comes strongly upon her. That as she ministers the word, she ministers from the strength of glory, from the throne room of heaven. And as she speaks, all oh, the heavens are opening up. Oh, the heavens are opening up. I said the heavens are opening up. And the realm of his glory is filling this place because of the portal of heaven. This house is blessed by the house of heaven and by the Lord's words. For his word goes forth and it shall not return to him void, but it shall accomplish that for which he sends it forth and it brings pleasing, a pleasing aroma to his nostrils. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now you don't hold back. You go full-blown and full-bore. You don't put your foot on the pedal to brake on one end and put it on the accelerator on the other. You just keep it on the accelerator and you just go for it. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Good morning. Good morning. Um, how many of you can agree with me that the enemy never gets to win? He's already a defeated foe. Amen? Amen. Well, I... I I need to remind myself and remind each of you that God has called me to be a preacher of righteousness. Amen? I'm here to preach the righteousness of God and that you are made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. And so um, before I get into my message this morning, I'm going to preach to me. Is that okay? Can I preach to me? Okay. I'm going to preach to me for a minute. Sometimes it's important that you preach to yourself because, especially as a minister, because as a minister, in which all of you are ministers, amen, but as a minister, you get so busy ministering to others that sometimes you forget to minister to yourself. And so I'm a minister to myself for a moment, amen? 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 says, who his own self, who his own self bore my sins in his own body on the tree, 
that I, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Thank you, Father. Who his own self, Jesus, who his own self, the very righteousness of God, righteousness, bore my sins, mine, on his own body, on the tree, so that I could be dead to sins. Righteousness bore my sins so that I could be dead to sins, so that I could live unto righteousness by, listen, by the stripes that righteousness took on himself, I'm healed. By the stripes that righteousness himself, by the wounds he took, by, by the sin, by my sin that he took on his own body, on the tree, by that, by the, by the wounds that righteousness bore for me, I get to not only live free from sin, I get to live healed because it's by the stripes. Of we, we, yes, it's by the stripes of Jesus. But if we'll recognize that it's because righteousness took my place, I get to be righteous. And because righteousness took my place, I get to be righteous. I'm not just righteous in my spirit. I'm righteous in my whole being. And, and that means that every part that isn't right becomes made right in him because he has made me the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And that means that anything that tries to come upon me in my mind, in my body, in my soul, in any fashion, anything that tries to come upon me that is not right, if I will remember that righteousness already bore that, he made an exchange for me so that I could have, as pastor's been ministering to us for weeks now, so that I could have the ministry of reconciliation, not just to reconcile you or the world to Christ, but to reconcile myself that I can take myself and say, hey, wait a second, you have been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus because he who knew no sin took your sin upon his own body on the tree and he took the wounds that persecute you on his own self so that you could live under righteousness. Now, that doesn't mean I get to live as this Christian and just tiptoe through the tulips because I'm a Christian. No, that means that I get to have all the fullness that's in righteousness. And righteousness simply means everything made right as God intended it. God's right. So if my body isn't right, that's not right right? If, if anything is out of order, righteousness reconciles me to God. And, and listen, has already reconciled me to God because by his stripes, you were healed. That means it's finished. Amen? So I receive that right now in the name of Jesus. I needed to preach to myself because I've been so busy preaching to all of you that I have not been preaching to myself. When you preach to yourself is when you receive. Listen, listen, hear what I just said. When you preach to yourself is when you receive. Testimony peaks your, 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 your spirit man. You hear testimony and you're like, wow, but you're not, you're not saved by the word of my testimony. Yes. It's by the word of your testimony. And the word of your testimony comes by the blood of the lamb. Amen. 
It's when you preach to yourself. Now, we can preach to you all day long, and you can sit there and hear it and hear it and hear it and hear it, but until you receive it, see, because we receive it by taking it for ourselves. We receive it by saying, that's mine. That's mine. Body, you hear that? Mind, you hear that? Circumstances, you hear that? Marriage, you hear that? Uh, finances, you hear that? You, you, children, you hear that? Grandchildren, you hear that? You, 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 when you begin taking it for yourself and say, that's mine, that's mine, it belongs to me, and you begin to preach it back to yourself. You can preach it back to yourself sitting right there in the chair. You begin to hear the word that's coming out of the pulpit, and you take hold of it and say, yes, I receive that. Yes, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Yes, righteousness has borne my sicknesses and my diseases on his own body. He bore my sins so that I wouldn't have to. Righteousness did that for me. He didn't just do that for Pastor Tara. He did that for me. And if he did that for me, then it's mine now. I've preached to myself, I have received what belongs to me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. Well, that's a good message. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. John chapter 8. <laughs> John chapter 8. Verse 12 says, Then spoke Jesus again unto them. I like how it says again. He's like, in other words, listen, in other words, in John, we might be hearing this for the first time. But in the ministry of Jesus, this wasn't the first time he said it. Then spoke Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. He that follows me. This word follows is literally what, what you would think of as follows. It's following one who proceeds ahead of you. But then it's not just, listen, it's not like follow the leader. Because if I'm following one that proceeds ahead of me, they're always ahead of me. But this follow takes me from following the one that's ahead of me to coming alongside and accompanying him. I'm part of his company. I'm not just behind. I'm part of his company. I'm with him. He is among me. He's among you. He's his kingdom is here. He's present. I'm following Jesus because I'm following him. I'm not Seeing him off in the distance saying, hey, wait up, wait up. I'm trying to catch up because that's what a lot of Christians feel like. I'm following him, but he's way out there and I don't know how to get there. And they feel like they're always trying to catch up and say, Jesus, wait for me, wait for me. I, I'm trying to get there. No, when you're following Jesus, he brings you into his company. You are with him. You're walking beside him. The, when, the, when the disciples came with him, you know, I'm sure you, you have a, a great company of people. You have people that are behind, people that are in front. I don't necessarily picture Jesus as walking out in front. I think he just walked somewhere in the midst of them. Got his closest right near him, and he's, he's just among them. You know, I, I think of it like this. Um, we have been having gatherings of some sort or another here since we got here, right? It's the church thing to do. You have gatherings. We, we make food and we have potlucks and we have, you know, stuff for conferences and there's gatherings and, and we have precious people in this house that love to honor their pastors and they want to serve us first and they want to put us at the place of honor and have us sit down and eat. Have you noticed, Love Walk, that your pastors don't know how to do that? And, and that's really hard for some people to take because you want to honor us. But see, the heart of a pastor, the heart of a shepherd, the heart of Jesus was to be among them. He wasn't looking for the place of honor. He said, I didn't come. I, I came to be with you. I, I came to, to be with the sheep. He came to be among us, right? And so, you know, I, I think of... 
most of the time, now I eat, I ain't ashamed. When, when there is food, I'm usually the first in line, let me eat, because then once, I'm, once my belly is full, then I can minister to all of you, and I can go from table to table, and hey, I love you, you know, but you, if you ever notice, Pastor Tara, she's right there, like, I'm not, no shame here. <laughs> Give me my plate, let me eat, because I know once the visiting begins, food isn't going to happen. Right. But my husband's opposite. He's like, I don't know, make me a plate. If there's any leftover afterwards, I'll eat, right? Oftentimes, he doesn't eat at all because even if you hand him the plate, he's busy eating and talking. You could put the plate right in front of him, and probably there's still going to be food on that plate, and it's going to get cold because he's too busy being among you. Now, I, I like to be among you too, but I, I like, you know, I, I got to put some food in my belly, right? Right, now, now, unless I'm preaching, if I'm preaching, then I don't like too much food in my belly. That's, that, it doesn't feel good to have a full belly trying to be talking. That's just not fun. Anyways, that's kind of carnal, but okay. Um, I am the light of the world, he that follows me. That means I'm among the light. The light's among me. I'm with the light. When I, I talked about this last week, when when. Light is present, darkness isn't. They're incompatible. Light can never know darkness. Darkness can know light. You can have a dark room, and once the light comes on, darkness is gone. What, what happens? Darkness is like, oh, there's the light, right? But... The light can't know darkness, because if there's light present, then darkness is in retreat. And listen, it doesn't have to be a very big light. It doesn't have to be a very big light. If light is present, darkness is in retreat. The moment you, you light a candle, you can go from pitch black to light. Oh, but it's still dark in there. Yes, but darkness has retreated. We, when uh, years ago, uh, uh, when my kids were pretty young, we were homeschooling and we did a science project. And it was just science. Uh, it, just science. It was a science project. It was interesting. But my kids' response to it was spiritual. I love when you get a spiritual response and you weren't looking for one. Uh, you know, it's cool when it was your idea, you know, you're like, oh, I'm going to make this into a spiritual object lesson. But when your kids do it, it's like, whoa, wow, that was profound. <laughs> Where did that come from? So we had this, we had this thing. We were learning about um, surface tension. On water, it has a surface tension. You, in in order, you have to break the surface tension of water. This is how uh, I was, uh, Micah and I were discussing a few weeks ago about how um, if you jump from a really high place, you can either make it into the water safely or you die, depending on how you enter the water. If you have to enter the water in such a way that you break the surface tension, if you don't break the surface tension, then it's like you hit a concrete wall. And so when you jump into water from a high place, if you don't break that surface tension, then it's like you impacted from that high place onto a concrete ground. And, and because the water will, will sustain that, that hit, that's why belly flops hurt, right? Okay, because when you belly flop, you didn't break the surface tension first. Your body just hit the water, smacked it like hitting like you're falling on something hard, and then it breaks the tension, and you go under, right? Okay, so we were doing this uh, science uh, experiment and had to do with surface tension, and so we took a bowl of water, and we put pepper in it, just poured pepper, 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 and the pepper is floating on the top because the pepper wasn't breaking the surface tension of the water. It's resting on the top of the water. Then we took a small bar of soap and just barely touched the water. And when you touch the water with the soap, because the, the chemicals in the soap break the, the surface tension. And so what happens, though, is that when you touch it, it doesn't just break the surface tension. 
the the uh, the pepper that's all across the top of the water immediately retreats. It it comes it it's you've got that that spot in the middle that you touched, and all of a sudden there's this perfect circle, and there's nothing on the surface in the middle, and all of the pepper has gone to the outside and is starting to fall into the water. No longer floating, it's falling. And my kid's response to this was, wow, that's just like when Jesus comes on the scene and the devils flee. (laughs) Because what happens when light comes is that darkness retreats. That's why when you resist, when you submit to God, because God has to be present. If you resist the devil, but God's not present, devil thinks you're funny. And his torment gets stronger, and he gets meaner, and you get more down and, and more confused and more hurt and more broken, more stressed, and, and everything that, but if you're submitted to God and you resist the devil, The result is he has to flee. Why? Because light's present. And where light's present, darkness flees. Amen? Amen. So let's go uh, go to 1 Thessalonians. Thank you, Lord. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Let's go to verse 15. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. That means, listen, see that you don't render evil for evil. You can't take revenge. You can't hold a grudge. See that you... That see that none of you render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. That means he's saying among the church and out in the world. You can't act one way towards your brothers and sisters in Christ in a different way to them. Or vice versa. A lot of Christians will act better to them than they will to the people in here. It, it it can go either way, right? And, but it says, see that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Now, this word follow is a little different than the other one. This word follow, see the, the, the other one where Jesus says, follow me, it's, it's coming behind one that's proceeding before you and then to the point where you're in his company, You're with the person you're following, right? Okay, this word follow, it means, and and it says ever follow, okay? That word ever means always and at all times, okay? There's no room for, well, sometimes, in this circumstance. There's no room for justification of something other than this, right? We like to justify ourselves, right? Because, you know, in this situation, it would be okay. Right? Oh, let me give you one. This, this one's a really hard one, and I'm not saying that I, I I'm, just, I'm just throwing it out there. It's the first one that came to my mind. But you'll often hear, you know, I would never hurt anybody unless, <laughs> unless they hurt me or they hurt mine. I would never, I would never hurt anybody, but if, right, yeah. Well, now, now, I get it because we're emotional creatures and, and you know, I'm, I mean, I'm a mom. So many of you are parents. I understand the concept. I, and, and I can't say that as a mother, you know, or as a wife, I can't say how I would respond because I have no, I, if I'm not in that situation, right, Okay, so I'm not trying to imply that, oh, you better never, you know. I'm just saying that we make justifications for when we can, but this is ever, always, and at all times, okay? God's way of doing things isn't our way of doing things, but he's fully aware of our situation down here, (laughs) right? 
Okay, but ever follow, this word follow, ever follow, always and at all times follow. This word follow means to run swiftly in order to catch, to run after, to press on as one that reaches, that seeks to reach a goal, uh, like as in one who's running a race and you're looking to cro cross the finish line, okay? To seek after eagerly, to earnestly endeavor to acquire. This means this is my aim. I'm aiming at it. I'm aiming, I'm going after always and at all times. I'm aiming at following after good. Now, this same word here is in another passage that I've been using here recently. Let's turn quickly to 1 Corinthians 14.1, and if I could have that in the Amplified, please. Same word, follow. 1 Corinthians 14.1, Amplified. Eagerly pursue and seek to acquire this love. Make it your aim your great quest, okay? If I'm, if I'm eagerly seeking after doing that which is good, isn't that in the same category as seeking after love, right? Because I'm seeking after good, right? Now, good in this world is subjective, but good isn't subjective to God. Good falls under the category of his love, it's not, it's not subjective to God. Here on this planet, you know, amongst human beings, uh, good is subjective to your situation. This is good, but this isn't. But it might be good for you, but it's not good for me, right? Because good, we, we have a, a hard time using that word accurately, right? Okay, so we're to seek after and pursue and eagerly seek to acquire love, and we're to seek after and pursue and eagerly uh, seek to acquire good. And, and not just good as in gaining good, but as in doing good, right? As opposed to rendering evil for evil, okay? All right, so let's go to Mark chapter 10. We're all good. Mark chapter 10. Let's start at verse 17. And when he, Jesus, was gone forth into the way, there came one running. I think we often miss that part. There came one running. He's running. This guy, this guy isn't just in the crowd. He hears of, sees Jesus, and he takes off running, okay? When he was gone forth into the way, Jesus, when Jesus was in the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Verse 18. And Jesus said unto him, why do you call me good? There's none good but one that is God. Now, as I was reading this the other day, I, I got, I, I'm going to share with you what, what the Lord was, was speaking to me. And I, it's, it's, it's really a different take on this, but I'll get there in a second. Okay. <laughs> Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, why do you call me good? There is none good but one, that is God. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor your father and mother. Now, before I go any farther, every one of those commandments... Okay, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor your father and mother. Those are all love commandments. They're all love commandments. They, they, if you just say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, that's, that's the, it, it, if we just break down the Ten Commandments, okay, the, the Ten Commandments break into two categories, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself, 
all 10 of them. They, they fall into one of those two categories. It's either have no other gods before me, uh, keep the Sabbath day holy, uh, and I, I'm not trying to remember all of them at the moment, but, but the first, the first uh, I think, four, I think it's the first four. Anyways, the first four relate to loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And the next six relate to loving your neighbor as yourself. It's a little love command. God didn't give 10 commandments. He gave one. Okay? And, and all of the other ordinances and commands that God gave to the children of Israel were safety commands. They were health commands. They were wisdom commands. They were things that he said, if you'll do this, you'll stay healthy. You'll stay well. I mean, I think it is amazing that God taught a people back, you know, a couple thousand years before Christ to wash their hands after touching a dead body. When Westerners didn't learn how to do that until what, the late 1800s? <laughs> Three years, yeah. Yes, we just learned how to wash our hands. Yes, we definitely did. 2020, we all learned how to wash our hands. Okay, but God taught the people how to do that. But that's really, it's not about, oh, I gotta obey that command. That's those are health and safety commands. Those are common sense commands. They're not, oh, if I don't do this, I'll break the law. Th those are just, I'm, I'm a good God and a loving father that desires to take care of you and keep you healthy, to keep you safe. Well, oh, but, you know, we eat these foods and God said not to eat them because, you know, they must have been unhealthy. They were unhealthy. They didn't have the means to prepare them and cook them and do the things that we now have. They couldn't measure and say, is it at 160 degrees or is it at 120 degrees? You eat chicken that's only at 120 degrees, you might end up in the hospital. But you eat that same chicken at 160 plus, you're just fine. But they didn't have a thermometer. So God said, you can't eat that kind of bird. Not because there's anything wrong with the bird. Same thing with shellfish. And anyways, I gotta, gotta move. I'm just, I'm just trying to help you. This is the love command, okay? All right, so this is the love command. Keep going, verse 20. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these I have, have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, one thing you lack, go your way, Sell whatsoever you have, give to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. And follow me. Come be part of my company. Now, I want you to, I want you to observe what's happening in this passage. This man came running to Jesus. I've always looked at that scripture there where Jesus says, don't call anybody good but God. And then sometimes, you know, we can get caught up into, oh my goodness, I can't use the word good. That only belongs to God. And, and we, can, we can get kind of weird about stuff like this. It, it's, this is what the Lord showed me the other day. And it's, it's something I've never seen before. And you can take it or leave it. I don't really care. <laughs> Jesus saw this man running to him. He saw a man that had revelation of who he was. Just like when Jesus was speaking to his disciples and he said, who do men say that I am? And they said, oh, well, some say John the Baptist and some say Elijah. And, and he says, yeah, but I want to know who do you say that I am? And Peter said, Lord, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And so what the Lord showed me here is that he saw this man running. And as he ran to him, Jesus recognized revelation in him. And the man said, oh, good master, how can I have this life that I see in you? And Jesus' response to him seems odd. There's none good but God. He's throwing out that nugget of revelation. I think you see me. I perceive you see me. But do you know what you see? 
Do you know what you see? Do you see the good God in me? Do do you see him? Because he's right here in front of you. Now, the commandments are love, 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 love. But I've done all that, Lord. Mm. But one thing you lack, loving me. Give everything you have and come be part of my company. Give everything you have and come and follow me. And in that moment, see, this is why this is why this church will never cease to minister to you the tithes and the offerings. The tithe is not the law. You are not by any means obligated to give in any fashion. You are not required by the law of God to give tithe. That was required of the Old Testament. But here it is, the New Testament, and Jesus is saying, this one thing you lack, everything has to be set aside for me. You have to trust me with everything. And if you'll trust me with everything and come be part of my company, I will take care of everything you have need of, okay? And so, so you're never going to hear us change our stance on that because we're not preaching to you a law. Oh, if you don't give your tithe, God's not going to care for you and he's not going to love you and he's not going to take care of you. God still loves you. It's not a law. Where you can get into trouble is if you'll just give. See, the, the, the tithe is the least you can offer God. You can, oh no, you can give less. You can give less than the least. But if you can trust God with that, and then he says, do you trust me more? And then he says, do you trust me more? And to this man, he perceived his revelation, and yet the man's revelation wasn't strong enough to keep him because that money and those possessions had a bigger hold on him than the revelation of the good master he saw in front of him. We can't let our revelation of the good master in front of us be tripped up by how much money is or isn't in our bank account or how many possessions we have in our home or what things we still need or what we want or what we don't have or what somebody else has more than us or whether we live in a big house or a small house, we trust Jesus. We trust the Father because he's good. Because if we will follow his command of love and trust him with everything that we have, He saw this man. I love how he looked at him. He looked at him with compassion and loved him. He, because he saw, he he saw his heart. He saw the revelation, and he also saw his response. He saw it before he did it. He saw he was going to walk away. He saw he couldn't trust him. He saw he wouldn't follow him. But his heart leapt. Jesus' heart leapt inside of him when he responded. He, he, he saw the revelation. This man came running to him. He saw the Christ, the son of the living God. And yet the money, the possessions kept him from following him. You, you're never going to hear us change our stance. There's people out there that are changing their stance, and there's people out there who have different opinions. And, and listen, they can have all the opinions that they want. But you can't convince me otherwise because I've seen what God has done for me, and not because I give enough, but because I trust him. Because I trust him and I honor him, and, I, and he is more important than what I have. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.
Let's go to um, 1 John chapter 4. Verse 17. In this is our love made mature, that we have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Now, actually, I'm going to back up a verse, because in order for us to know in this, in this is our love made mature, we need to know what it is our love is made mature in. So let's back up to verse 15. It says, whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God. See, that's what was happening in that exchange there between Jesus and that man. I see that you perceive who I am. What are you going to do with what you perceive? Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him and he in God. He's, he's following him. He's, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God has become a follower. That's all that this, that's what Jesus offered that man, to be a follower, to, to have the Son of God dwell among him. God dwells in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has to us. God is love and he that dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. We're part of his company. We're part of his company and in that position as part of his company, Love is made mature in us so that we can have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. In that place, there's no fear because perfect, mature love casts out fear because fear has torment. And God has no intention for you to be tormented. That man's possessions tormented him. The fear of what will I do if I don't have those things tormented him. In the Passion Translation, starting at verse 15, it says, those who give thanks that Jesus is the Son of God live in God and God lives in them. We have come into an intimate experience with God's love, and we trust in the love he has for us. God is love. Those who are living in love are living in God, and God lives through them. By living in God, love has been brought to its full expression in us so that we may fearlessly face the day of judgment because all that Jesus now is, so are we in this world. Love never brings fear, for fear is always related to punishment. See, that man thought he was being punished. A lot of Christians think that they're being punished because they got to give a certain amount. You don't have to give a certain amount. We get to give. And it's not a punishment because in a place of trust, not fear and obligation, God's able to exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, meet our needs. Amen? But love's perfection drives the fear of punishment from our heart. From our hearts, Whoso, whoever walks constantly afraid of punishment has not reached love's perfection. Our love for others is our grateful response to the love God first demonstrated to us. Anyone can say, I love God, yet have hatred toward another believer. This makes him a phony, because if you don't love a brother or sister whom you can see, how can you truly love God whom you can't see? For he has given us this command. Whoever loves God must also demonstrate love to others. 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Amen? Amen. Well, I praise God for the word, and I praise God for his righteousness at work in my body and in your bodies and strengthening us, and he is a good God, and it is going to be a good day. Amen. 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 Thank you for joining us today. If you'd like to partner with us, please visit our website at lovewalkcc.org, or you can reach us by mail at 13319 Wallaceville Road, Houston, Texas, 77049. Remember, continue to walk in the extravagant love of Christ.